Hey there, welcome to this episode of the Skift Meetings Podcast, the podcast for curious professionals embracing the future of business events. My name is Miguel Neves, and I am the editor-in-chief of Skift Meetings. In this episode titled, The Business of Business Events, I have the pleasure of speaking with Sheriff Karamat, the CEO of PCMA. In our conversation, we talk about things like the strategic importance of using the right terminology and why the term business events is the right term for what we do. We talk about why great events are the ones that generate transformative impacts and how we make that happen. We talk about what is needed to evolve the industry and fight the lack of speed that is typical of associations and governments. We talk about what the future of associations in the business event sector could look like. And we talk about why AI can be so transformative for business event professionals. I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation and I invite you to check out the other episodes of the Skip Meetings podcast. You can find them on our website or by subscribing through your favorite podcast service. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Skiff Meetings podcast. And today I am really happy to be joined by Sheriff Karamat, the CEO of PCMA. Sheriff, really nice to have you with us today. Miguel, likewise, it's really nice to be with you on this podcast today. I look forward to our conversation. Excellent. Um, Sheriff, we've known each other for uh, maybe 10 years, something like that, uh, through IMEX, PCMA, all these sort of things. But I'd love you to just int- start by introducing yourself. Um, and I'd like to kind of two key points I think are really important. One is, I guess, your first introduction to the world of business events. I always think that's a really interesting kind of first uh, perspective. And I guess the journey then to becoming CEO of PCMA would also be uh, I'm sure part of your introduction, but I'd love to stress those two points if you don't mind. Oh, thank you, Miguel, and thank you for asking about my journey. Um, uh, My first journey to business events was circuitous. I actually, I'm not sure I knew about business events or uh, or really had any interest in it at the beginning. I was very much a person that wanted to be in sports and soccer or football, as they say in Europe, um, or the rest of the world outside of US and Canada. And um, and uh, um, I was very much involved with the Toronto Blizzard, going back many many years ago. And uh, the the at that time the North American Soccer League um, had approximately ten to twelve teams, and the league folded, and subsequently the team had to fold uh, because there was nowhere to play except international games. However, the owner of our team, the Toronto Blizzard, actually owned nine hotels in Canada. And he approached me and said, I believe that you should consider being in the hotel business. And I actually knew nothing about hotels. And But that's how it started to introduce me to have an interface between um, the hotel, the supply side of the business, and event organizers. And that was my first taste of... um, of, uh, of of that part of the business um, and getting into understanding what the business events industry was all about. Um, they used uh, terms back then like Congresses, conventions, and um, some of those terms are still uh, used today. I personally think, and even in PCMA's name, the word convention, but I really believe that there's nothing conventional about what we do uh, in business events. It's about really transformation. And so um, I, I, I've, I've really um, taken to heart that word lately. Um, but my journey uh, then led me um, to the Convention of Visitors Bureau in Toronto, uh, which uh, was called at the time Tourism Toronto, now called Destination Toronto. And um, that at, at that time, uh, this was going back a number of years ago. SARS happened in in Can and in, in, at least in in Toronto. There was a very significant impact on SARS. And during that time, the CEO of PCMA reached out to me and say, "How could I help?" And um, it was the start of really getting involved with PCMA. Even though I was volunteering for PCMA plus under other industry associations, I was volunteering for. And uh, um, at the end of SARS. The then CEO said, had you ever considered working for an association? And I said, well, I really don't know that much about working for an association, but I certainly like them. And I was offered a job in 2003. And that journey led me to uh, a C-level position at PCMA. And um, 
after about two years of Deborah Sexton joining as CEO, she said um, she wanted me to be the COO of PCMA. And um, and that I, I'd stayed in that position for over 10 years with Deborah before uh, Deborah decided that she wanted to do other things and move on from with her career. And uh, the position was offered to me. And uh, hopefully, uh, um, I believe the reason why the position was offered to me was because I was very instrumental in writing the strategy and the strategic direction of where PCMA should go. And, and, and they felt that I should be the person that would deliver that home. And so that's how, what got me to this place today. Excellent. So thank you for taking us through that. You, you, you singled out this idea of business events and not conventions and conferences and symposiums. Can you talk a little bit more about why that using that expression business events? And I think you also use business event professionals a lot in PCMA's uh, communications. Why is that so important to you? Well, well, I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, business events frequently get um, uh, bundled with tourism, and 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 we are not tourism. We actually business events is about driving economic good for individuals, organizations, and communities. And and there is a big divider as in terms of what you do for a business event versus traveling uh, for leisure. So I think that there's an important. It, this is critically important. One, two is that. Events drive a lot of economic good, a lot of social good, a lot of knowledge sharing, and that is about conducting business. And um, I, I don't want that to be lost in 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 other industries and other sectors. It is important for organizations, corporations, and government to understand that that the events that we hold is about moving our economies locally and globally. And nationally, and and that is why that is so important. It is you know, that this, these business events have social impact, and they are also there to help us move society forward, and to help move everyone's social lot in life uh, for for better living and better standards. So. Uh, it, that is why it's important. And I hope that others would see it that way. And they would um, realize that um, words matter and how we communicate those words to broader society will, will give us greater acceptance in broader society as in terms of a profession, but also the role that we play to, to, um, to affect change um, in, in other areas of business. I think that's always a really interesting topic. So appreciate you, uh explaining that or kind of uh, going into detail there. Um, and do you think that I, I, I completely agree, but, but when it comes to, you know, if you go for a very academic event, you know, like when it's a very professors that are interested in the science or something like that, um, they might not like the idea of being part of business events. Is that an issue or is it sort of like they could call it whatever they want, but us in our industry, we call it business events. And that's why it's important. Yeah, I, I don't think it's an issue. I believe that it's a free country I and a free world. And I think that people, if they're comfortable with the terminology they use, but I also want to know the, those professors to know that the role that they play, the knowledge that they share, the impact that they have is very important to the business community. And they are driving business outcomes. They are helping uh, society to be more knowledgeable. And all of that lends to a more uh, a productive society. So they might not call it that, but their impact is that. So, um, uh, and I'm perfectly happy uh, with them calling it what they want, as long as they continue to share knowledge and to help our society grow. Yeah, I like that approach. I think that that makes sense. Just a, a quick a quick question that I think is serious, although it may sound a bit quirky, which is, how do you explain to family and friends that aren't in the industry, what you do and what kind of PCMA members do. Yeah, well, you know, and this is the delineation um, of um, uh, leisure versus business events. When when anyone had anything organizing an event, it could be a wedding, it could be a funeral, it could be anything. Um, 
when you organize it, suddenly you get an appreciation for what people in business events, business event organizers do, what they facilitate because of an outcome and focusing in on that area. So what do you want in an outcome and relate it in, into the terms that they understand? Have they ever um, attended a conference? Have they ever attended a seminar? Have they ever attended a webinar? And do they know how, or did it just magically appear? And once you explain that, they get a better understanding. I will tell you, uh, some of my family members still think I could be their travel agent. So uh, um, they are always asking me for hotel deals. Which I, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, well, so, it's a tough one, but, right? But yeah, but it's it is such a critical role. And one, I feel that it's an obligation of us to explain better because the role we play is so critical. We focus on just the, the logistics of what we do um, in, a, in many instances, hopefully that's changing. But if we think of the impact first of the logistics and tell people why you do those events, then they'll get a better appreciation of it. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely agree there. So talking a little bit about events and strategy and design, um, I, don't, I don't think we can cover the whole syllabus, but I'd love to get a feeling from you of what you think really makes an event go from good to great, kind of borrowing from Jim Collins is good to great. We all know mm. conferences can be you know, average or just kind of satisfactory, but some of them are really excellent. I mean, you've just had your PCMA Educon record attendance. Congratulations. Maybe use that as an example. What what do you think are the key ingredients that make an event go from good to great? Um, and yeah, so using that, Jim uh, Collins, you could have a very good event where people are really satisfied. But are you truly having an impact on them? Is it truly transformative? Did it spark something in them that they will do something tomorrow about it? Is the event really having that transformative impact? So I would say um, event design is really important to make that happen for starters. Um, uh, uh, how you design events that immerse people to ensure that they can be participants and not attendees as a start. So I am I'm very much into words and attendees to me should not be a word that we use. It signifies something that um, it is not a, a multi-way conversation and discussion and participation. It seems like almost a one-way when you're attending to absorb, but actually the audience actually has a lot more to give than any expert. And so first and foremost, are you bringing out the knowledge and the, the, the know-how of the participants? And are they engaged in helping to not just create, but actively deliver on that content is, is one. Two is the experience and the, the backdrops and the, the settings that you have. Is it is are you is that allowing to facilitate even greater engagement and greater participant in in um, in in the, the the ideas that you want to convey and the transformative impact that you want to have? Uh, so to a a good event would be people attended and say yes yeah. You know, I, I it was okay. Uh, there was a lot of people there, um, but to me, being at Educon and having a record attendance will matter not to me, or and and more than likely not to anyone that's attending, if that that experience didn't make them feel that they took away tangible things that will transform them as an individual, their work environment, and hopefully some of that to their communities. Um, hope this isn't a trick question, but what did mm. you, what was your transformation out of EduCon? Because I think, you know, if, if it really works, it should work for everybody, even the CEO of the organizing uh, association, right? Yeah, um, a couple of things that I um, realized in, um, in EduCon for myself, and that is, one was we um, did a... Um, uh, an accessible uh, session. And it was about 
um, uh, uh, taking wheelchairs where you actually had to sit in wheelchairs. And we had quite a few of those sessions where people went through the entire event through wheelchairs and uh, saw you 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 were in the eyes and the seat of someone that used a wheelchair for mobility reasons. And what it did was give you a complete different perspective on how, how um, uh, people with uh, different uh, accessibility or uh, issues or whatever that issue might be, um, the challenges that they face in navigating an event and how uh, lack of access that they have in society. And so to me, that was a big transformation of how we can be better and more intentional in our design so that we can allow for uh, greater involvement, not just at conferences, but in society in general. And I, I believe um, we talk a lot about equity and inclusion, but, but very frequently those things are race-based, gender-based, uh, sexual orientation-based, religious-based, and not enough of uh, accessibility-based. And so that that is a good, uh, for example, if, if I would, um, if I put one out there. there, there are quite a few, but that one really resonated with me. And um, not just me individually as a person, but how I want to see all PCMA events and hopefully all industry events designed that will, um, that will make people feel like they belong, they're welcome, and they can actively participate. Yeah, I think that's an excellent topic. And we were looking a lot into that uh, on, on skip meetings as well. Also, neurodiversity, I think, is a big topic right now. Also, understanding different learning styles and different needs, of different people that are neurodivergent or not, right? So whatever we can do to make things universally accessible to everybody who wants to participate, I think the, the better we are for it. Absolutely. And, and neurodiversity specifically uh, that you mentioned it is awareness is half the battle. Um, once people are aware, um, we have to move them to ownership. And when we move them to ownership, they will take action. Um, and so um, I, I, I feel that whether it's neurodiversity, whether it's accessibility, awareness is a big part of it. And and how we do that and how we articulate that um, to move people into ownership and action, I think it's so important. Um, and I, I just feel that uh, not to sound uh, 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 Pollyannish about this, but to, it, it will um, allow for better experiences. It's also, if you tie it back to business, it's better for organizational profits and it's been proven over and over and over. So not to be um, selfish about funds or crass about money, um, but it does make a better economic impact for companies. And at the same time, uh, it is the right thing to do. Absolutely. And if you link things to company processes, if you link things to business processes, then you have a much better chance of succeeding, right? And changing things for, for good. So. I think that's an excellent point. Wanted to, as we're talking about um, your events, so your major Educon just happened in Montreal and you have convening leaders happening at the start of the year, as it usually does in San Diego next year. Um, would love, I'm sure that there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, a lot of planning, a lot of design, but are there is there anything that you can tell us about what you've learned from previous editions of convening leaders and perhaps Educon that you're going to apply to this next convening leaders? Uh, maybe anything that's different or anything that's evolved that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, um, uh, one of the things about uh, um, convening leaders and PCMA in general, which I hope the entire industry and all the organization um, um, adopt is that they should never stop experimenting. And I, I, I don't believe you have to experiment on everything you do, but unless we experiment and push the boundaries and try new things, uh, first, we will know if they, if they work. But secondly, it would allow people to, uh, um, to really expand their creative side, which, which that is where um, the magic ha happens. And that is where um, breakthroughs happen. And that is where we learn. So uh, at 
um, at Educon this year, we experiment in many different facets of um, of the type of content, the type of experiences we created, um, and and the environment allowed for that. Uh, the same is going to be in San Diego in January 2024, but it's going to be even greater. The type of experimentation, the way we design um, interactive sessions, the way we are going to um, uh, engage partners so that they can uh, activate their brands, it's going to be completely different once again. And we are going to um, also incorporate um, additional um, areas for um, for uh, people with climate and climate tech and sustainability, as well as uh, AI and innovation and event tech. So um, just evolving those areas because they're all solutions that people in the business event space are looking for, but evolving them uh, um, in a way that it's, it's about, uh, it's more participatory, and and getting people um, in uh, to be able to experience it versus a sales pitch. Yep, like that uh, approach. I well, think that's excellent. Oh, go ahead. We also want to take advantage of San Diego. We are going to be an, an incredible destination, and that allows you to do things indoors and outdoors at that time of year. So we will be utilizing every asset that we get in San Diego that we can get in San Diego to make sure that that actually happens. So um, look for some very interesting things that we do, not just indoors, but what we do outdoors. I don't want to share all the secrets. We want people we want people to come and immerse themselves in it. That sounds great, though. I think it's, uh, if you can, hopefully the weather is good for you at the time. Even in San Diego, it could rain, so you never know. But um, yes. I think it'll be great to have that outdoor experience. And more and more, I see events doing that. So I think that's a, a really good innovation. So we'd love to talk a little bit about the evolution of PCMA as well. You already mentioned a little bit in your introduction about your your strategy that you were a big part of while you were a CEO, I believe, and then that also yeah. led to the CEO role. Uh, and I've seen you know PCMA develop over the years, and I'd love to talk a little bit about maybe that strategy and kind of the next strategy, sort of where you where you think you're going to go next as an organization. Yeah. So PCMA uh, developed the twenty vision. Uh, many years ago, um, 2018, we launched our 2030 vision. Um, hopefully, we will be launching uh, in the not too distant future a 2040 vision. Um, uh, just to um, and that is a vision about the business events industry, a vision about the profession, a vision about what we stand for. So that vision, first and foremost, was um, uh, um, that. This profession should be valued, and the people that participate in this profession uh, should be valuable and valued by their organization. They should be contributors uh, to economic growth and social uh, progress in society, in organizations, and, and should result in personal development. Uh, the profession should be desirable um, at every level, including the college level. Um, so, so those, that, that is in terms of the profession, uh, that the, the profession should also be fun and people would want to get involved in the profession. Uh, and that, that was all part of the vision of 2030 being the platform for the business events industry, uh, PCMA, including myself have struggled in this industry because we felt that, uh, um, we were, um, uh, this industry has been slow adopters and adapters of technology. They've been slow adapters of new ways of doing business. And um, we've always been seen as a laggard industry that follows others. And um, uh, we have this powerful, powerful platform that brings people together. Why should we be a laggard industry? Why should we not be leading in in um, in uh, in using this platform for economic change and social change. So, 2030 vision, PCMA firmly believes that it wants to be the platform for the global business events industry, where all are welcome, and um, and it's about driving economic and social good, not for PCMA, 
but for every individual that participates in PCMA, for the organizations that they work for, and for those communities that the organizations reside in. And um, uh, so that 2030 vision also, um, uh, hopefully, um, if we are the platform for the business events industry, um, we will we we want to ensure that um, that anyone that wants to be involved, there's a pathway for them to get involved with PCMA, more importantly, the business events industry. And this profession is valued uh, by other sectors, uh, by government, and um, and is seen as a profession that really is, that makes such good contribution to society, which I don't believe even today is not recognized as such. Really interesting. I wanted to go a little bit deeper on the point you made about the industry being a laggard or slow to, to adapt. Just wanted to get your thoughts on why do you think that is? Is, is it a risk thing because events are so time specific and so it's so hard to take risks in case things uh, fall apart or or are there other factors that make it kind of harder for the industry to evolve faster there's two sides to that and i want to say that some of the event participants have to take own some of that one is that event participants were very comfortable in the logistical side of of organizing the events itself and not focusing on the outcomes, they were focusing on the output. Um, and if if you're not focusing on the outcome, then someone else is writing the strategy for you. So they looked at the event organizers as really providing a service, but not really um, really thinking of the strategic outcomes. And I believe that that single-handedly is the biggest disconnect. Event organizers did not have um, a, um, a voice on why does this event contribute or is important to the strategic goals, uh, the strategic objectives of a corporation or, or an association or government as for that matter. They looked at it merely as a function, you, you organize or gathering and we're the ones that are gonna do the thinking um, or they're gonna do the thinking. Um, I am telling you that is a major miss and that is part of the reason why um, we were being dictated to do as a function, not as thought leaders and actually people that actually can actually deliver the strategy for the organization. And, and that to me, we have to own that and we have to do something about it. And doing something about it is, is about our ability to be creative, our ability to bring new ideas and new new um, new ways of doing business that will help drive those those outcomes that that organizations are looking for, but be a part of actually the setting of those objectives and setting of those um, those organizational goals. Otherwise, um, I I fear that we will continue to be a laggard industry. Uh, we will continue to be. Um, uh, slow adopters and adapters. And um, I, I, the other side of that is that um, uh, it is true that associations, governments included, um, are slower than the corporate world at, at, at moving. And, and that could be because associations and corporations um, and governments, their motives were not necessarily uh, for profit, their motives were very different, and and I'm not saying that 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 it is universally true, but when when your motives is the bottom line, um, you respond very differently than when your your motives are not, and so that could be partially why there have been not resistance, but um, let somebody try it first before we do it. And um, and so I, I believe that is changing because while many associations, for example, are nonprofits, they're also not for loss. They cannot be in, they cannot exist if they're losing money. Um, because how, how else would they have funds? And so um, I think that realization is dawning on many associations today. And um, they're realizing that also in order to attract incredible talent, 
we have we are not competing with other associations. We are competing with the broader society, uh, uh, with any corporate organization for that talent today. And so it is incumbent upon us to also um, compensate uh, employees appropriately so that we can have the talent that we need to so, to be successful. I'm sure event professionals all around the world will uh, will will appreciate that and and be in favor of that. Um, we'd love to talk a little bit about the association um, spectrum. You know, there's a lot of associations out there. Um, there are some voices saying that we should merge. We should we should have less associations. There's a lot of different choice. You've made the point that you want everybody to be welcome at PCMA. But you know, being on the MPI board for four years, I'm I'm well aware of another large association in the industry. Um, what's your thought on that? I mean, we have the EIC, Events Industry Council, sort of the federation of associations, and then we have a number of associations with significant overlaps. Is that just the nature of the beast, or would we move faster if we merged? How do you see that developing? I certainly don't believe it's the nature of the beast. I uh, firmly believe that association was structured uh, by individuals individuals with really good attempt, intentions, um, but they were structured for the association and not necessarily for the benefit of the people that they serve. And um, um, and as and and when they were structured, some of these organizations are 70, 80 years old. That it was perfectly okay. And at that time it was perfectly um fine. However, it is interesting to me and I hopefully to our audience today, that in our sector, if you look at it globally, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of organizations that are serving the same sector. And it appears it's only in our sector that ha that happens. And when we dilute that, when we think we can only serve one sliver, uh, and I do believe that certain niche organizations have um, a, a purpose, but people do not buy that way. Consumers do not buy that way. Consumers do not engage that way. And so I feel that uh, mergers, acquisitions, uh, collaborations are inevitable. And there will be organizations that are going to try to resist that. and maybe to their detriment, because their members, their customers, their consumers are not are not thinking that way. They don't care what, what PCMA or others are, um, uh, are doing. They care about, is it providing the value that they're seeking so that they can be better in their profession, their organization, or their community? And, um, and is it, is it uh, a rewarding experience for them? And and I believe personally competition is extremely healthy. I don't believe that we should have one organization that rules the world, but I also believe that we are um, what we are doing is diminishing the value and putting uh, the onus on the consumer. While the consumer has gotten a lot wiser and they're they they are walking with their wallets and their feet and they're doing what they need to do. And so either organizations get smarter, or I believe that people would select and do the things that they need to do. I absolutely believe there should be more consolidation in the industry, and it is badly needed. And if we don't get our uh, le leadership and egos out of the way with respect to that, I think we will regret it. And, um, and the organizations themselves would lose out because um, because people will go elsewhere. My my other statement to that is what is happening is that people are already doing that, but they're not going to the associations. They're going outside of the associations to for-profit companies because they're tired of um, of organizations delivering the same um, average um, experiences content. And, and knowledge. And so um, uh, the, if this time post COVID or this new era that we're in is not a wake up call, I don't think it will be a wake up call. 
I will tell you, Miguel, at PCMA, that is not the case. You, in the last few years, we have acquired, we've collaborated, we've created joint ventures. We're doing it all to ensure that we can provide the value that's needed for uh, anyone that wants to engage with PCMA. Interesting. Um, what about merging with MPI? Is that something you would ever consider? I mean, they're the two largest associations. They seem to have a lot of crossover. A lot of kind of uh, members or, or non-members keep mentioning I don't something think, like that. I don't think anything is off the um, table when it comes to me. Um, uh, uh, ultimately, uh, a board of directors, uh, um, my board of directors would make that decision. But um, they have never been uh, uh, afraid of uh, any um, any opportunities that came their way if it would benefit the business events industry. And, and if it would be in the best interest of the PCMA membership, they would absolutely jump at it. As you saw, we did um, an acquisition uh, with uh, SEMA and we felt that we could be beneficial to the SEMA audience and SEMA uh, uh, audience felt that PCMA could help them in their goals and they could help PCMA. Uh, so I, I thought that was, uh, we did the same with EMA UK. We, um, ELI, um, as in terms of a learning platform, but two others that are very different, or three others, is the relationship we have with Destination International uh, on the joint venture for Destination, well, now called Showcase and Business Events Week, and the relationship we form with GevMe um, uh, to introduce Project Sport to the world, as well as the relationship with AGU and more to come on that relationship around sustainability and sustainable business practices that will uh, we will um, unfold in, in Copenhagen uh, in the fall of this year. Interesting. Before we jump on Project Spark, because I do want to talk a little bit about AI. Um, I remember we covered uh, the SEMA uh, acquisition, but also ELI and the EMA acquisition, and there was some audience members that felt that they didn't necessarily want to be part of PCMA and they joined an association like SEMA for a particular reason. You know, they wanted to be mm -hmm. in a in a group of corporate planners or only corporate planners. Maybe that's where they feel safe or they feel they belong. But now being sort of part of a large organization, they felt that that wasn't what they signed up for. Now, of course, you're saying, you know, everybody's welcome, but I could also see that that's a strong reason why you want to be part of a specific group. And then when that group gets acquired, it may not be fulfilling what, what you're looking for. How would you respond to that? Or, or how are you kind of dealing with that? Yeah, I, 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 I don't believe an acquisition means that they have to become just PCMA. I believe that I absolutely agree with those uh, SEMA members who didn't feel that they wanted to be a part of a larger association. And that is exactly the reason why um, we have grown SEMA uh, uh, and continue to grow SEMA um, to ensure that the SEMA community with together um, is very strong. So we have, where we have integrated has been the things that make sense to integrate, like finance, like marketing, uh, the, the back of the house. But as in terms of the content, the experiences, the community that they want to build, we have not, we have made sure that those things have the opportunity to flourish. We, uh, the executive director, the advisory board, they're all people from the SEMA community, not from the PCMA community. And uh, what I have to offer anyone with respect to acquisitions, mergers, and, and, and the continued growth of the business events industry, that if you come a part of PCMA, it's not about PCMA just taking you over. It is about helping you and help your community to thrive. And, um, and that is what we've done with SEMA. That is our intention to do with EMA UK. And uh, and and so forth. So, I um, hopefully, uh, and that was certainly a big concern of the SEMA audience. But hopefully, more than two years in, the brand is alive and well and growing, and PCMA hasn't taken them over in the sense of um, you know changing everything and everything is now under the PCMA umbrella. 
um, so that that not, people feel a lot more comfortable and they still have uh, the SEMA community that's alive and strong and getting stronger every day. And PCMA is able to put the resources that they might not have had uh, being at SEMA on its own. Um, and so this is an opportunity where if PCMA, for example, is a big tent, um, we can create opportunities for uh, organizations to thrive and and uh, and and be successful. And and in in SEMA, in EMA UK, they've all kept their brands the way way it has always been. I, I like that. I think you're trying to approach and create a best of both worlds situation, right? Where you have the resources and the umbrella organization, but then have the individual uh, desires of the members and the reasons why they become members of, of those specific associations. Yeah, and, and also, uh, Miguel, um, there's two other things. One of the things that I've heard from SEMA audiences, that they enjoy some of the benefits that they can get from the PCMA audiences, i.e. the knowledge that can be shared from the PCMA existing members. And PCMA members truly, truly value um, the experiences and the knowledge that corporate event marketers have, uh, uh, and they learn from each other. So uh, while the two organizations are very separate as in terms of um, their communities and so forth, there is opportunities to collaborate and learn from each other. And we try to do that, for example, at convening EMEA or at Educon or convening leaders and at SEMA Summit to, to expose so that they, they can say that, okay, this is where two and two can actually make five and and, um, and and benefit each other and still have their own communities. Excellent. Excellent. Good to hear. So let's talk a little bit about Project Spark. I mean, that was announced at IMEX. Uh, I've played around with it. We've done some reporting on it. And it's a pretty interesting collection of different AI tools in one platform. So I think it's it's very smart in that sense. And it's a collaboration with GevMe. Right, which is a, an event tech company based in Singapore. Um, how did that come about, and and what are the kind of future plans for it? Anything that you can share there? Yeah. Um, so why did it come about, and uh, why did it come about for, for a bunch of reasons? One is that we were studying what was happening in the world, and I, I guess I, I I would say I would give Chat GPT a lot of credit. Chat GPT sort of good and bad normalized or made uh, AI a, a household world. Um, we were all using AI for a number of years. We had on our website through Siri and so forth, but really people didn't consciously think of AI the way uh, ChatGPT brought it to the forefront of the world. So I give them huge kudos um, with respect to that. But what we saw uh, was, um, when we were looking at what was impacting industry, we, we looked at sustainability, we looked at AI, and we looked at ChatGPT itself. And diagrammatically, um, sustainability was very consistent, but level across the board. ChatGPT was a big spike going up and up. But AI in general was off the charts. It was so high as in terms of people's interest in AI and the impact that it was having on their daily lives as well as their businesses. And where PCMA uh, saw an opportunity, but I, I think opportunity is a bad word, um, where they saw something was the impact that it was going to have in associations and organizations in engaging its customers and making its members more productive. And what we initially saw was fear instead of how, how can this help us? And so that was the start of the relationship with GevMe. Um, GevMe, obviously a tech company, uh, uh, um, uh, Vmall was on the PCMA's board, so it and and what they were doing, um, and the the notion that that we were fearful of something that actually could be our co-pilot or could help us was was um, was concerning to me personally and and should be concerning to everyone, um, 
And that is why we really wanted to latch on to the phrase that um, uh, uh, AI is not going to take your job away, but the people using AI will. And um, and so how can we demystify, uh, destigmatize, um, understand privacy concern, understand the potential pitfalls and dangers of AI, and 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 gate those things, and then focus on the good things that can do uh, for individuals and organizations. And that is why um, we started on this. We now going back to the profession. And I, I said this earlier in, in, our, in our dialogue. Something that is important is event organizers focusing on output on strategy. AI can really help individuals, event organizers, to be uh, take away the mundane tasks so that they're focusing on the things that truly delivers value for them. And we believe that every event organizer should be, and associations and corporations alike, should be incorporating certain elements of AI to assist them into being better professional and being more productive. And that is why this this the journey started. Super interesting. Thank you for taking us through that. And any future plans? I mean, it's currently sort of open and it's got a waiting list and it's open to PCMA members, but will it be a PCMA exclusive? How are you kind of handling that? No, it's not going to be PCMA exclusive. It's going to be open up to the world. Um, eventually, uh, we will launch a business model to it, which we're hoping to do uh, in convening EMEA in Copenhagen um, uh, in September. And that will um, the, the 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 business model would be launched there, um, and uh, but we want it to be open to the world at, at all levels, even with a business model. At all levels, there will be certain access to it to the world that will be free, and because we believe so strongly that AI is not just here to stay, it will literally transform. It is, I believe. Uh, and I said this before, it is it is certainly, I believe, more powerful than when the internet uh, came on board. Uh, but I believe it's as transformational as when we move from the horse to a car and, and what it did for society. And that's what I believe that AI has that transformative power. Um, and, um, and it would be a shame if our industry um, didn't take full advantage and use this because we will be left behind because someone else will. Absolutely. Um, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about sustainability. We've covered a little bit already, but it, it is something that sort of feels like it's in danger of being left behind when there's economic uncertainty and there's AI. But if we don't solve our sustainability issues, we may not be around to really take, you know, reap the benefit of any of that. So We'd love to kind of get your ideas on on where we are with sustainability or where we should be. Yeah, I I, I think with AI being the hottest latest thing, um, you know, you people can easily lose sight of uh, sustainability. I also believe that if we don't do the right things, people can actually have fatigue uh, of a, a subject. And interestingly, sometimes when things move slowly or they don't impact you directly, uh, you don't think it exists. But, you know, I believe it was a couple of days ago um, that we had the world's hottest day uh, ever recorded. Uh, the, the reality is that our planet is warming up. Um, sustainability is an issue. CO2 emissions is an issue. But humans also have to live. And, um, uh, our relationship with AGU uh, about uh, uh, sustainable business practices around uh, knowledge sharing and education, uh, um, about uh, benchmarking and also offsetting uh, is, is so important. Um, uh, and um, you are right, right to point out that we're wrong if we don't solve it. I do believe 
that there's an interesting time that we're facing, and that is technology is advancing so much that technology and climate scientists uh, pose a real potential to help us in um, in our ability to solve some of the major challenges around climate. Um, I also um, believe that we need to uh, speak in different terms. We tend to um, speak in a way where we actually um, vilify people that um, have powered of economies for so many years, and we should not be doing that. The, um, our current energy um, sources, we need them. We we absolutely need them. And we have to coexist with current energy sources while we uh, create new energy sources and develop new energy sources. So I, I am... I have least patience for people that vilify oil and gas and, and so forth, because uh, we would not be here to the place we are and the society that we have and the privileges that we have if it wasn't for uh, those energy sources. Now, um, is, is, is that absolutely our future? Uh, uh, no, uh, but we have to develop them while we continue to be uh, uh, reliant on powering ourselves. And so we've got to coexist. And so I'm hoping our rhetoric towards um, our legacy industries are such that um, that that it changes, that changes that conversation. And then then as we get to broader society, talk about what are the benefits on creating these new energy sources? What are how are they going to impact not just our lives? as in terms of our longevity, but also the type of jobs that they're gonna create in the communities that we live in so that we can have more meaningful jobs. So I think there's a lot of positives here. It's something that none of us should top, stop talking about. And it certainly is something that is going to imperil all of us if we don't take action. I think that's a really interesting, really wholesome approach, you know, not vilifying, I think is a very interesting point. And obviously, meetings are a big part of driving this forward and figuring out what the next steps are. So it'd be great to kind of be part of that conversation rather than um, try to ignore those conversations or kind of hide those conversations in some way. Yeah. And, I, and if I may add, I am also adamant that I will not allow anybody to vilify people that participate in events. Um, I do believe the solutions come when we meet, when we get together. I also believe that solving the climate crisis does not mean that we have to stop being humans. And we saw what happened during COVID. Uh, we saw what happened during COVID um, with respect to um, uh, um, uh, mental health issues that are, are, appeared on the scene. There was always mental health issues, but we never heard of them to the extent that we heard of them uh, during COVID. And the fact of the matter, human beings need to be with other human beings and we need to meet. And if we're going to advance our society um, and we're going to break down barriers and we're going to have common understanding, we need to continue to meet. So um, I am also not a fan of those um, uh, that will vilify people that meet for business event purposes. Well, let's let's not end on a low point, but I think this is a you know a topic that's definitely worth discussing and worth uh, continuing and evolving the discussion. I think meetings are an important part of that. Sheriff, been an absolute pleasure talking to you. We could go on for hours, but I know we we everybody's busy and we want to make sure to keep the conversations relatively short. Really appreciate your time. I would love to get your recommendation for someone who should be a guest on the podcast. Well, you know, since we are talking about climate sustainability, I would like to recommend the interim CEO of American Geophysical Union, AGU, Janice Lachance. Uh, I really believe her take on an approach um, to help solve the climate issue um, is something that everyone should hear. And what AGU and the climate scientists that they have around the world are doing uh, to help, uh, I think that uh, she will bring an interesting perspective, Miguel. Uh, so I will highly recommend her. 
I think that's an excellent recommendation and we, we look forward to continuing that conversation. Uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, having, finding more solutions to the sustainability issues that we have and being part of that conversation. Sheriff, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today and everybody listening. Hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did and uh, see you next time. Miguel, thank you so much. It was my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. 